Uh, yeah, so that was the main agenda for today's session. It was a session organized by ASCO uh, and AOTIC jointly. So the, the theme of the session was value in cancer care. And Dr. Christopher Booth, also from Queen's University, he talked about how to use real world data to inform real world clinical practice in low resource setting. And I talked about how to balance lack of access issues with the issues of uh, over treatment in low income countries. So this is a very interesting theme for me uh, because as you know, whenever we talk about low and middle income countries, we talk about uh, African countries, poor resource, resource setting. We always talk about lack of access, lack of access. We don't have CD scans, we don't have PET scans, we don't have new drugs, we don't have uh, targeted agents, we don't have immunotherapies. Yeah, that's true, and that's a big issue. There is no doubt about it. But as clinicians, as practicing physicians, can we actually do something about it? Unfortunately, not much, uh, because that's something that has to be solved in the level of uh, policy makers by the government. But nowadays, I have started to realize uh, in Nepal, India, and now also while discussing with colleagues from Africa, I have started to realize that there is another growing epidemic uh, in cancer care in low-income countries, and that's, that might sound surprising, but that's not lack of access, but overuse of resources, over-treatment, over-diagnosis. And this is a very important concern, especially for low-income countries, because, because these are low-income countries, we don't have enough resources to Western interventions that are going to be of no value. So because we are low-income countries, we need to be specifically uh, concerned about whether the interventions that we do are going to help the patients or not. And if they are not, then that would be just waste of money and waste of resources, waste of human resources. And, you know, for example, I talked about screening. Uh, nowadays, in low-income countries, especially where there is a private healthcare system coexisting with the public, and private healthcare system depends on, on financial incentives. So the private healthcare system comes up with attractive uh, slogans for screening campaigns. For example, uh, if you, there was an advertisement uh, called, if you, if you love your mom, get her a mammogram. So there was no discussion about the age of mom, there was no discussion about the risk factors, or whether uh, she was at high risk, low risk. But an emotional appeal that if you don't send your mom for mammogram, no matter what her age is, then you are a bad son, you are a bad daughter. Uh, similarly, there was something called prostate health package. And it offered PSA test and also prostate ultrasound as a screening for prostate cancer. That makes no sense, even in high income countries. Uh, there is a cancer screening campaign where they, they perform tumor markers, CA99. Uh, CA-125 as a modality to screen for cancer. Like these are very, very, I, I would not say these are low value. These are in fact negative value. These are harmful practices. Uh, so if we are spending our limited resources on, on such practices, then that's, uh, then that's the pot of money that could have been used for, for greater good, for, for interventions that would have actually helped patients. And this is about screening and overdiagnosis, uh, but we also see this in medical oncology, in, in, in prescribing of drugs. So we get so much attracted with the newer drugs and we put so much focus on access to newer drugs um, that we, we forget that these newer drugs may or may not necessarily be uh, helpful for our patients. And uh, one common theme I have found, uh, like why this happens, why, uh, for example, a patient uh, in, in Nepal uh, gets adjuvant sunitinib for renal cell cancer. Uh, we don't do that even in Canada. Uh, we don't recommend that because the benefit is marginal or non-existent. But why does these things happen in low-income countries then? So in discussion with colleagues, I have found that there are two reasons for this. One, they believe that if a drug is approved by the FDA or any other Western regulatory authority, they believe that it must be a good drug. Uh, that's why it went a thorough review at such a prestigious body and the prestigious body thought this is a good drug, uh, good enough uh, to approve. So if a drug has been approved, then maybe that, that, that means the drug is a good one and we should be using it. And the other is about inclusion in guidelines. Uh, you know, someone says, mm, we should use this because it's in the NCCN guideline. Uh, so we are taking Western guidelines or the Western drug approvals as marker of efficacy and we are uh, trying to use uh, that practice uh, into our uh, local setting 
uh, forgetting uh, the fact that uh, the approval or the guidelines, they were made in a different circumstance, in a different country with unlimited resources. And even in those countries, uh, now the resources have become so constrained, we are starting to talk about financial toxicity. So uh, these were, uh, in general, these were the overall issues that I talked about today morning in the ASCO AOTIC session. It also depends on how much resources we have and would making a local guideline, uh, because that will also cost money, right? So would that be a, be a priority? Uh, so I do think that uh, having a local guideline is important, but at the same time, I, I, I think that uh, our, our major focus should be on what I refer to as avoiding wisely campaign. Like similar to choosing wisely, I, I prefer the term avoiding wisely. So at least all countries should have a list of uh, the common practices in their setting, which is not effective, harmful, and costs and 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 has healthcare costs or human resources costs. So you know, uh, like recently they published choosing wisely India. So they made a list of ten practices that uh, they recommended should be avoided in the context of India. So. I would, I would highly support every country coming up with a list of uh, low value care that they can avoid. Making guidelines is quite uh, intensive. You have to make guidelines for each and every cancer. Um, and and it is, ideally, we should be making guidelines, local guidelines. But uh, if that's going to take time, I think the first starting point would be just to make a list of things that, uh, as a policymaker, we would say, please avoid this. Uh, and uh, there are plenty of examples. I, I published a paper in eCancer Journal uh, in 2016 where I made my own private list of uh, low value practices in oncology that we could safely avoid. Um, and I had, I, I, I believe I had nine recommendations there. But I think it's time for me to update that table. Now I think we'll have like 20 or 30. Uh, yeah, my yesterday's talk was about uh, using colorectal and lung cancers as examples of how to balance between uh, undertreatment and overtreatment, or uh, how to uh, practice cost effectively in a low resource setting. Uh, so, for example, you know, we sometimes if we have access to, then we indiscriminately use those resources simply because we have access to, uh, and like using PET scans to monitor responses to treatment. Um, so uh, it, with regards to medical oncology, with regards to drugs for colorectal cancer and lung cancer, I give example of, uh, for example, in, in colorectal cancer, we do uh, RAS testing in metastatic colorectal cancer patients. And if, the, if we find that there is no mutation, then we recommend a drug called cetuximab or panitumab, uh, ideally, uh, and especially for left-sided tumors. Uh, but if that mutation is present, then the drugs will be ineffective and we don't use that. So this is the standard guideline uh, in the West. But in low-income countries, we, we fall under tricky situations. These are expensive drugs and the margin of benefit, it's not that great. Uh, the margin of benefit, there is benefit in overall survival, but it's, it's um, you know, whenever we talk about targeted drugs, especially in low-income countries, we tend to believe that by targeted drugs, we think that it's, it's going to be like imatinib in, uh, in CML or it's going to be like Herceptin in breast cancer, like game changers. But most of our other targeted drugs are not like that. They are very modest. Um, so in our countries, we fall under a situation where a patient says, I can afford like four cycles of the drug, but I, I don't have enough money to, to afford uh, the whole 20 cycles of uh, pantumab. Uh, so uh, what should I do? Is four cycles of anti-EGFR antibody better than no cycle at all? Um, this has been tested for Herceptin in breast cancer uh, as adjuvant treatment. Ideally, we give one year of treatment, but if uh, but is giving only for six months as good as giving for one year? Uh, is giving for nine weeks as good as giving it for one year? So, for breast cancer patients, we do say that if you can afford even three cycles, even nine weeks that's much better than not having Herceptin at all. So if you can afford only three cycles, we should still give you Herceptin. But in case of colorectal cancer, that's not the case. The benefit is, the, the benefit with the total 20 cycles or, uh, until progression is modest. So the benefit with four cycles, five cycles, we, we don't have any evidence to say that it's better than uh, getting nothing at all. 
And for this, we need to do the RAS mutation testing, which in itself costs some money for the patient or the healthcare system. So one point was if the patient says, the patient is not going to be able to afford the whole treatment, then there is no point in just testing for the mutations. Because it would be like, we test for the mutation, and then the patient says, I can't afford the drug. So the patient has to live his uh, rest of the life with the knowledge that he has a mutation, and there might be a drug that may benefit him, but he can't afford that. So what's the point in doing the test? So that was one example. And the other example was about the duration of adjuvant treatment. Uh, there is a big debate in the GI community about uh, whether the adjuvant colorectal cancer treatment um, for um, patients who have underwent surgery should be three months of treatment or six months of treatment. And generally, we keep fighting about that in the West. But uh, you know, if you look at the IDEA trial data, IDEA um, uh, meta-analysis data, then you see that yeah, there is some debate about non-inferiority. But if you look at the difference, in the absolute difference in terms of disease-free survival, then the difference is not that big. So for low resource setting, uh, for low risk disease, we give three months of um, adjuvant treatment, no matter where we are. But for high, high risk disease, still there are many institutions who prefer to give six months of treatment. But I believe that in low and middle income countries, giving three months of treatment is quite enough. And uh, and I would prefer to use oral tablets, capsidamine, to injectable 5-FU in low resource setting because when you're giving injectable 5-FU, that comes with uh, more frequent visits to hospitals and that comes with the need for a uh, pump uh, or a pick line and capsidamine will avoid all these sort of uh, extra health uh, care burden. Uh, so that was uh, other example from colorectal cancer. And of course, there are examples of drugs like ramucirumab, um, jaltrap, or uh, regorafenib in colorectal cancer that are very, very low value. And accessing or, or, or paying for those drugs should not be a priority at all for low and middle income countries. In, in case of lung cancer, uh, now this is again uh, a, a discussion about choosing wisely. Uh, you know, in lung cancer, we have seen a number of new drugs that uh, have improved some survival, but they cost quite a lot. On the other hand, uh, in 2010, there was a very seminal paper published in New England Journal uh, we saw that if we start palliative care early, uh, then the institution of early palliative care in itself improves survival by nearly three months for patients with uh, advanced uh, uh, non-responsive lung cancer. So I, I made a joke that if this was called palliatimumab, then maybe everybody would have used it by now. Uh, but uh, the fact that um, people don't make money out of it, uh, and it, this, this trial was published in 2010, we are 10 like this, we are discussing about it a decade later, and still, most of the institutions don't uh, routinely uh, recommend for early palliative care, uh, even though we have seen good survival benefit. And it costs uh, like it's a very high value care. It 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 doesn't cost much uh, compared to all the other newer drugs that we uh, get so excited about. Uh, and uh, you know, the other 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 topic of discussion was what we call as desperation oncology. So patients, we know that patients are going to die very soon, but patients in the very end of their life, in the last six months of their life, in the last 60 days of their life, are receiving new treatment. Uh, that is quite harmful practice. Uh, that worsens quality of life, that worsens quality of death, that worsens quality of life-death transition for the patients. Uh, so uh, no patient should be spending last 60 days of their life getting chemo, suffering the toxicities, uh, it's the time for them to have a peaceful transition. But uh, we have seen that even in low-income countries, uh, especially because patients present at an advanced stage and we feel like we're obligated to do something, uh, we end up uh, prescribing chemo and unnecessary treatment towards the very end of life.